Well, good morning. I'm glad that you're here. Hopefully that you had a good week. And uh, if you haven't, we uh, serve the same God, and he walks through everything with us, whether it's good or bad. So as we remember that, and remember that our God is good all the time, not in just uh, good circumstances, let's uh, stand and let's begin to worship this morning. This is a song that we learned uh, last week, so we're going to redo it this morning. Here we go. From the darkness I called your name Into darkness your mercy came You called me out and lifted me up How great is your love For my weakness you took my shame my burdens in fields of grace. You called me out, you lifted me up. How great is your love. From the heights of heaven, you stepped down to earth. Innocent perfection gave your life for us. We are amazed, and we stand in awe. We have been changed by the power of the cross. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great.
everybody you can be seated this is the day the lord has made we will be rejoice and be glad in it we're glad that you're here this morning hope that you're having a good start to the day we want to welcome you to northwoods church and uh, we invite everybody to uh, find a bulletin around you we do this every week it's nothing new but uh, if you're new to the church uh, this morning we'd, we'd be delighted for you to grab a bulletin and inside there are a couple of things the main thing is this uh, connect card we are wanting to connect with one another and we hope that you'll find that and fill it out to the degree you're comfortable and then we have some boxes at the back of the room at the end of the service we would like for you to put those in there uh, there are also some things for families to uh, if you have your kids sitting with you there's some color pages in there and you can feel free to use that to to interact with the sermon and uh, and their announcements are of course in the bulletin and an outline on the back of the bulletin for you to follow along with but we just want to welcome you this morning I hope that uh, this day will be a blessing to you we have planned it to try to uh, to connect with the Lord and with one another and so we want to do that this morning would you join me in prayer as we begin our time this morning father we are grateful for this day and uh, as we've already said we've reminded ourselves how great is your love for us behold what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God and I pray that today, Lord, we would recognize all that's true about you this morning. As we sing these songs, that we would focus our attention on you, who is good and right and true. And Lord, we would be reminded of what's true about us and, and our relationship with you. I pray that you would give us hearts that are receptive to hear your word this morning. As uh, Lord, we seek to worship you. We give this day to you. We pray that you would be honored. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together and continue to worship.
find is holding on to me. God is holding on. And when the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. Down, fights till I'm not pleased tonight. 
deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of seated. If you have your Bibles this morning, would you take them and turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 13. 2 Samuel, chapter 13. There's some sermons you're excited to preach and some sermons you need to preach. Um, today falls in the category of I need to preach. And uh, hopefully you'll see that as we walk through the passage. We've been dealing with a series called The Rise and Fall of a King, talking about the life of David, dealing with seven different scenes out of the life of David. Um, his life had a trajectory that went upward. I sort of put this off to the side on the, on the little whiteboard on the bottom left he was an anointed shepherd to be king. Then you'll see that a few days later he kills Goliath, or months later at the very least. And then he was an effort to be killed by Saul, speared, thrown at him three times, and then he goes on the run, and then he had an opportunity to kill Saul in a, in a cave but he wouldn't touch the Lord's anointed he becomes king at Saul's death and there was unparalleled peace in the life of Israel all of the enemies were defeated Mephibosheth he honors one of Saul's grandkids Jonathan's great grandkids Jonathan's grandchild gives him grace and you'll notice this upward trajectory the rise of a king and then there was Bathsheba and Uriah he sees a beautiful woman and he doesn't control himself he knows that she's the wife of Uriah he pays a penalty and then you come to today's passage where it's not simply about his own passions, but it's about his failure as a father and the topic of shame. Everything looks good in his family on the outside, but his family is utterly broken. We're going to see five characters in the story today in 2 Samuel 13. And when we see... We will see pain and shame and nothing good. I mean, I, I just, like, I want to warn you. There is, like, in 2 Samuel 13, nothing good. Aren't you encouraged? Can't wait to attack the Scripture, right? There is nothing good in this chapter. But, promise you, before we leave, We'll find hope. I, I, I would say to you, I want to make an early referral to a book uh, that it will be helpful. It's, it is in a resource center. You can't read these words. They're very small print appropriately. It's, the whole cover is black. The book is called Rid of My Disgrace. It's marked out, Rid of My Dis, in red. And then the word is grace. It is written by Justin and Lindsay Holcomb. And they talk a lot about the topic of shame. And I would encourage you to check it out. Before we stand and read the word of God, I want to give you two definitions. This is not in your notes as far as on the back of your bulletin. But I want to give you two definitions that I think will help you through the sermon. 
I want to define guilt and shame. Guilt is when we have done something wrong, we've broken the commandments of Scripture, and we feel guilty. Shame is when we feel guilty, but we haven't broken the commandments of Scripture. So we still feel guilty with shame but we haven't broken the commandments of Scripture. Now that I've said that, keep that in your mind for where we're going. Would you be kind enough to stand with me as we read 2 Samuel 13? I'm going to preach most of the chapter, but I just want to read a few of the verses right now. Start with me, if you would, in verse 7. David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house where he was lying down, and she took dough and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and baked the cakes, and she took the pan and emptied it out before him. But he refused to eat, and Amnon said, Send out everyone from me. And So everyone went out from him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food into the chamber that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. But when she brought them near him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come lie with me, my sister. She answered him, No, my brother, do not violate me. For such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this outrageous thing. As for me, watch this statement. Where could I carry my shame? And as for you, you would be as one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Now therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you, but he would not listen to her, and being stronger than she, he violated her and laid with her. Let's pray. Father, I pray that in the next few moments, your Holy Spirit would be at work in us. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The first character I would like for us to look at is Amnon. He's the tormented son. Look in chapter 13, verse 1. It says, Now Absalom, David's son, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And after a time, Amnon, David's son, loved her. And Amnon was so tormented that he made himself ill because of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible to Amnon to do anything to her. Slide down to verse 4. He, Jonadab, said to Amnon, O son of the king, why are you so haggard morning after morning? Will you not tell me? Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Amnon was David's oldest son. He was first in line to become the king. He was the heir apparent, but he had a heart problem. He had fallen, quote, unquote, in love with his half-sister, Tamar. What do we know about Tamar? In verse number one, she is beautiful. I would like for you to catch this. Darren spoke last week about Bathsheba. David looks on a rooftop, a rooftop and he sees a beautiful woman. His oldest son sees a beautiful half-sister. By the way, just because a person's beautiful doesn't mean you have to lust after them. You, you ha there is the fruit of the Spirit called self-control. I think that that's important for us to possibly say right here you have the opportunity to turn your head you have the opportunity to remove yourself you have the opportunity to not meditate on that but Amnon wouldn't and I would propose to you Amnon knew next to nothing about love because what does love do love seeks the best for the other person Am Amnon wasn't thinking the best about Tamar. All Amnon was thinking about was himself. 
That's all he was concerned about. Amnon's love was about getting what he wanted. He had become obsessed with Tamar. We see nothing in all of this passage about Amnon loving God or living for God. And when that happens, something else takes the place of God. And here, we find that what he's become obsessed about, Tamar. Tamar has become his God. He was living to have Tamar. Now look, I recognize that this is not very comfortable. It's not very, if it's not comfortable for you, it'd be very, imagine how uncomfortable it is for me. But I would just say to you, I've had way too many conversations with men and women who could not get their mind off of someone they weren't married to or they could not get their mind off of a computer screen and it became their God you can feel so strong about something which is what I believe Amnon did Amnon had become so obsessed you can feel so strong about something you believe doing it has to be okay but no just because you feel that way that's a false sense of reasoning I can feel it's fine to hit you until I do and then we both will figure out real fast that was a bad move I feel guilty after I hit you and then I got to pick myself up it's irrespective of how I felt we don't live by our feelings our feelings will take us down a path that's dangerous we live by absolute truth the truth of the word of God notice the second character he had a scheming friend his name was Jonadab look in verse 3 Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab the son of Shemia David's brother and Jonadab was a very crafty man he said to him O son of the king why are you so haggard morning after morning will you not tell me Amnon said to him I love Tamar my brother Absalom's sister Jonadab said to him lie down on your bed pretend to be ill when your father comes to see you say to him let my sister Tamar come and give me bread to eat and prepare the food in my sight that I could see it and eat it from her hand so Amnon lay down pretended to be ill when the king came to see him Amnon said to the king please let my sister Tamar come make a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat from her hand it was Jonadab's idea Jonadab was close enough to Amnon he knew something was wrong and Amnon told him that he loved Tamar he was obsessed with her Jonadab came up with an idea for him to be with Tamar Pretend to, be deal, pretend to be ill and ask David to send Tamar to make you a, a meal and care for you. Jonadab's idea of being a good friend is to support him irrespective of if it was right or not. Let's pause there. That is not a good friend. A good friend is not a yes man or a yes woman a good friend will tell you no a good friend will say that's not a good idea you're surrounding yourself with people who only tell you what you want to hear you're not surrounding yourself with godly friends let me just show you a couple of passages out of Proverbs in the book of Proverbs chapter 12 it says this one who is righteous is a guide to his neighbor C catch that if a righteous person will lead you down a right path but what does the wicked do it takes you astray Jonadab was not guiding I, I like hunting and 
picture a, a hunting guide. What, what would the wicked person do? He'd get you lost. The righteous person will guide you. In Proverbs chapter 27, it says this, faithful are the wounds of a friend. They may say something you don't like, but faithful are the wounds of a friend, but what will oftentimes an enemy do? Profuses are the kisses of an enemy. So many times an enemy will just keep... Don't trust that. Don't trust that. Trust honesty. Imagine picking your car up from the shop after a routine tune-up and the technician says, car's in great shape. You have an automotive genius to take great care of your car. Everything's good. Later that day, your brakes don't work. Find out your brakes are have no brake fluid and your brakes are and are going out. Go back to the shop. Why didn't you tell me? Why I didn't want you to feel bad. Plus, to be honest, I was afraid you'd get upset with me. I want this to be a safe place where you feel loved and accepted. You'd be furious and you'd never go back. You say the same thing about a doctor's office. Doctor says to you, you're a magnificent physical specimen. They say that to me every time I go in. <laughs> Why are y'all laughing? You have the body of an Olympian. You are to be congratulated. Later that day, while climbing the stairs, you pass out. Find out your arteries are clogged. Go back to, why didn't you tell me? Well, I knew your body's in worse shape than a Pillsbury Doughboy. But if I tell people stuff like that, they get offended. It's bad for business. They don't come back and see me. I want this to be a safe place where you feel loved and accepted. Let me tell you, a good friend will tell you the truth. Let me show you the third character. The loyal daughter Tamar. We're going to read in verse 7, but we've already learned something about her in verse 1. She's beautiful. Now in verse 7, David sent home to Tamar saying, Go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house where he was lying down, and she took dough and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and baked the cakes she took the pan and emptied it out before him, and he refused to eat. And we don't know this yet in the story, but let me tell you something about what's going on. She's wearing a royal robe. It'll talk about that in a little while. This royal robe signifies that she's a virgin. It signifies that she is a virgin and that she is the king's daughter. That It has full arm-length robe. It is a beautiful robe. And I want you to catch that she is going, doing this with her own hands. She is obedient to her father. Come, she's living under her father's house. What is this saying about her? It is, at the very least, revealing that she's obedient. And I would propose to you, not only is she beautiful, but she is godly. But within hours of Tamar walking into Amon's house, she would be raped. She would be raped. Shame. Watch it. And don't read too fast. Verse 9. Amnon said, send out everyone from me. You feel the plot? Everyone went out from him. Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food into the chamber that I may eat from your hand. Tamar took the cake she'd made, brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. When she brought them near him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, come lie with me my sister shame will come into her life in three ways watch the three ways first she is betrayed 
Tamar goes obedient to Ammon's house after leaving the king's house where she lives under his protection. She should have been protected in Amnon's house as well. It's her brother's house. Let me pause and say, some of you may be listening to this and saying, but Bobby, this is just a Bible story and this kind of thing never happens. It does. And it happens to people's lives that I'm speaking to. She came to serve Amnon, her brother, and she would be betrayed by her own family, by the person she came to serve. Second, she's not only betrayed, she's violated. Look at verse 11. When she brought them near to him, he took hold of her and said to her, Come lie with me, my sister. Amnon empties the house. They're alone. Come lie with me. Tamar's godly response, verse 12. L listen to what she says four times. She answered him, No, my brother, do not violate me. For such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this outrageous thing. Four times she says no. 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 Let me, let me, let me be clear. Even if she hadn't have said no, it would have been wrong. When, the one, when there is one who is in power over another, we are never to give an excuse to the one who has power. She tells him no. And she even she appeals to a desire for him to have moral character. Verse 13, as for me, where could I carry my shame? And as for you, you'd be like one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He would not withhold me from you. Don't be a fool. And she even says, I think the king, if you would just please stop, the king might even let you marry me. And I don't believe that. I don't believe the king would have let him marry her. But what is she saying? Anything she needs to to get out. He was physically stronger. Verse 14, he would not listen to her and being stronger than she, he violated her and laid with her. Amnon gets what he wants. Well, it's over, right? It's all, a Amnon's now satisfied. Story's done. Third way shame comes. She's excluded. Verse 15, Amnon hated her with a very great hatred so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon now says to her, get up and go. She said to him, no, my brother, for this wrong in sending me away is greater than the other that you did to me. He wouldn't listen to her. What is this saying? Immediately afterwards, Amnon's love turns to hatred and Tamar's thrown out like trash to the curb. Notice the hurt that's created in Tamar. She is rejected beyond what has happened to her physically. And if nothing else, what this is showing us is that sex is not just a physical act. Tamar is thrown out verse 17 literally thrown out he called the young man who served him and said put this woman out of my presence and bolt the door after her she was wearing a long robe with sleeves 
for thus were the virgin daughters of the king's dress. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her, and Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long robe that she wore. She laid her hand on her head and went away, crying aloud as she went. So note, notice what this beautiful woman's now doing. She's, she's walked away, and she's, I, she's put ashes on her head. She's tore her clothes. And she's weeping loudly. Do you feel the pain of this? We brush this aside. Amnon did. One of the things I want you to experience this morning is I want you to I want you to have a greater hatred for sin. That when you see it, you hate it. And then I want you to recognize that that's us as well. Tamar feels so bad. She does this to herself. Shame brings its own baggage. Notice the fourth character who now comes into the story. Verse 23, or verse 22, or verse 20. I promise I studied. And her brother Absalom, Tamar's brother, full brother, said to her, she says, imagine he sees her ashes on her head, tore robe, crying loudly. What does he say? Has Amnon, your brother, been with you? That immediately that tells me he expected it. Imagine her nodding her head, yes. And then this is what he says. Hold your peace, my sister. He's your brother. Do not take this to heart. Absalom is extremely loyal to his sister and he knows that something's wrong even has a good guess about what has happened and who did it he can guess by Tamar's reaction with her dress and the ashes but Absalom gives awful advice this is what he says don't say anything move on do not take this to heart as if it's no big deal now let's be clear that is awful advice and what's interesting is, is Absalom does not take his own advice. He tells her to get over it, and he never does. You, you need to get over it now. And Absalom lets what has happened to Tamar fester and fester and fester and fester. So much so, look at verse 23. Absalom spoke to Amnon neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister Tamar. Verse 23, after two full years, Absalom had sheep shears at Baal Hazor, which is near Ephraim, and Absalom invited all the king's sons. And I'm not going to read the rest of this, but let me just say to you, he had a plan, he had Amnon come, and he killed him. because of what he did to his sister two years two years but I thought this was a sermon about David this whole series was I haven't even said a word about it he's the fifth character look in verse 21 the passive father what does David do when King David heard all of these things, he was very angry. That seems like an appropriate response. But what did he do? Zip. Zero. Nada. David did nothing to Amnon. Absolutely nothing. Some 
uh, some scholars and that I've read, some commentators have said, well, well, there's not a whole lot in the law that he sh- could have done. And I want, when I read that, I, I agree with some other people that read it, but hogwash. As a dad, you do something. As a dad, you don't step back and not do anything. You jump in. You say that it's wrong. and Clearly communicate and you defend in where there's been a wrong. You defend the innocent and stand against the guilty. And sometimes, guys, this happens in families. Tamar's done nothing wrong. Notice, I keep coming back to this statement in verse 13. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. In the English Standard Version, Tamar says this statement, As for me, where could I carry my shame? Where does shame commonly come from? This is not in your notes, but I want to give you three places shame normally comes from. Here's where shame normally comes from. One, from the results of sin that has been done to us. That's where it was with Tamar. She was raped. And she felt shame. Two, from standards that people hold us up to, but we can't meet or we haven't met. Well, my mom and dad thought I would be here and I'm here. My mom and dad thought I'd have a doctorate and, or I'd have an MBA or I'd have an MD and I have a GED. My parents, they look at me and they shake my head. They shake my head and their head. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not. I'll do better in the second service, but y'all won't be here. I mean, you, you understand? I, I, the, I'm... I experience shame because of I'm I don't measure up third from our sin that we have confessed and repented of that God has forgiven but we haven't gotten past He has cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. But I'm out there fishing with my sins. Digging them up. Thinking about all of the stuff that I've done that God's forgiven me for. And every time I do, I'm not guilty. He's forgiven my sins. I'm free of that but I feel this shame I, there's a pa- pastor friend of mine who uh, I talked with a few weeks ago he gave me permission to say this he went to a counselor in Nashville Tennessee there's a counselor in Nashville Tennessee he's sort of a, all of this guy's all of this guy's um, clients are pastors and he's sort of a pastor whisperer believe me we need one Uh, he's sort of a pastor whisperer and he this person had been working in a church out west and had come from a uh, a, he didn't leave well it didn't go well and he was still dealing with and processing this past situation and he was sitting in this with his counselor and and, and the counselor was asking him to tell him the story again. And he did, and he began to weep. And the counselor asked him to pause and say, what emotion right now are you really feeling? And what this counselor has in his office is he has eight emotions on the floor on eight different tiles. And he said, would you choose one of these emotions? that you're feeling 
And he, the guy, he looked down and said, shame. The counselor responded this way. He said, that's a great emotion for me as a counselor because it doesn't relate to personal sin. It relates to other people's sin and what they've done to you. And there's only one thing to do when other people have sinned against you and you feel shame. Run to Jesus. Remember how I told you this story in chapter 13 doesn't have anything good in it. But I told you we'd find some hope. Let's get to that. There's refuge when we feel shame. And that refuge of hope is in Jesus. See, I kept thinking about what are all, think about all the things Tamar experienced. And then I thought of somebody else who was sent by a father to a place where he should have been honored and welcomed. Think about that. He was sent by a father to a place where he should have been honored and welcomed. Tamar was, Jesus was sent by, I thought of a man who came to his own and it should have been a safe place. Came to his own. Should have been a safe place. Hmm. I thought of a man who came as a servant and was betrayed by those he came to serve. Huh. Sounds a whole lot like Jesus. I thought of a man who was stripped, spat upon, and pierced. I thought of a man who was loaded with shame and did nothing wrong. If you think about everything Jesus endured, I, I think of... Uh, a passage in Isaiah 53. We'll put this on the screen. In Isaiah 53, in verse number 4, I want you to watch these words. Surely he has borne our griefs. Notice that's not our sins. That's the next verse. Carried our sorrows. That's not sins. That's the next verse. You know, you know what he paid for on the cross? He paid for your hurt. He paid for what's been done to you. Where can I carry my shame? To the cross. That's where you can carry it. It's where you can find hope. When I, uh, used to be, used to be when I was growing up, people would bring Bibles to pastors and they would sign the Bible at the very front of the Bible and they would sometimes the pastor would put a verse in it. And when I first started preaching, I was, I was like 15, I was 16. I, I would, people would do that on occasion. The verse I would always put was Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Let me show you the verse. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Some of you this morning, as I'm preaching, you're going, I, probably I, you don't know what's been done to me and you, you, you don't know how ashamed I feel about all of the standards that I haven't met and you don't know about the sins that I keep digging up in my life you don't know about the shame I just know what we can do with it 
Because I don't know your story, and you don't know mine, you don't know my junk, and I don't know your junk, but I know this, I'm grateful for the cross. I'm grateful that I can go to him. The answer doesn't lie in that I need to love myself more. The answer is that I need to remember there's one who has loved me to a point that I will never get past. And I can never be separated from that love. Picture Tamar. Ashes on her head. And know that only Jesus can carry that shame. Author Shea Serrano had just taken an exit ramp near his home when his car sputtered and died. He tried unsuccessfully to restart his car. He called a tow, tr a tow truck. Wrecker promptly arrived and put the car in the driveway, popped the hood, fiddled with wires and hoses a bit. He didn't have much auto repair knowledge, and he called his dad. He was just a 18, 19 year old. Father listened as he explained what had happened. Father responded, I'll be there tomorrow after work. Shay's father lived 215 miles away from him. His dad was going to drive up after driving a city bus for 10 hours. Shay's father arrived on his doorstep three hours after he had turned in his bus at the bus depot. He said hello, hugged his son walked back out to the driveway to have a look under the hood he'd been out there for about 15 seconds his dad emerged from under the hood looked at his son returned his wrench to his toolbox walked past Shay to his own vehicle what's wrong did, did you not bring the right tools Shay said uh, dad dad just said well, I'm done what, what, what's wrong with it out of gas son Shay's dad ate with his son and headed home another 215 miles 430 miles round trip after 10 hours of driving a bus Shay said his dad didn't harass him didn't berate him he didn't ever he didn't bring it up at all as a matter of fact nine years later his father has never mentioned that embarrassing moment again. Do you know what God's not interested in? Heaping your past on you. You know what he is interested in? Loving you. He wants you to know he has grace. Would you bow your heads with me? This is a, not a fun sermon for me. But I want you to know that today there is grace in Christ. There is hope in the cross. If you've never put your faith in Jesus don't know that you have a relationship with him I want to plead with you I want to plead with you that you turn to Jesus he has paid the price for your sins so that you can be in a right relationship with him I am so glad to be able to say to you There is nothing that keeps you away from him because he's paid for it all. Run to him. Today, if you're reminded of shame, sins you can't get past, areas you don't measure up, things that have been done to you, 
turn to him. Recognize you'll never be loved by anyone more than he loves you. We have a next step table that you can come to today and uniquely today in the back of the room we will have at that next step table a biblical certified biblical counselor that you can talk to today if you would like to talk to someone there or maybe even set up an appointment for later and I'll be at the table down front but let's let's go to the Lord in prayer Father we love you we thank you for loving us I thank you for your faithfulness and for your grace I'm grateful for how you care for us and how you love us I am grateful that we don't have to ask the question where could I carry my shame without an answer I am grateful for the hope that we have in you thank you in Jesus name amen and thank you Bobby appreciate that so much and uh, Bobby will be right down here if you'd like to talk with him our certified counselor is a woman if you'd rather talk to a woman rather than one of our elders uh, then you can uh, do that as well. We'd love for you to respond to the message this morning. You can also respond on the virtual Connect card, texting the word uh, CONNECT to 812-214-1987, and we'd love for you to do that. We do have uh, a couple coming for membership this morning. Uh, Jared and Megan, Megan Wilson are there. If you'd wave them, let's make them feel welcome. We're so grateful to have you guys in the Northwoods family. Glad you guys are here. I've had a couple of announcements I want to draw attention to as we close our time together this morning. They're in your bulletin. Uh, one is that we have our Northwoods class coming up right after the 1045 service this morning. If you uh, want to find out what it means to be a member here at Northwoods, we'd love for you to do that. Uh, you can do that today. There is a, a, a free lunch, and then the class takes about an hour. And uh, if you have signed up for that, I hope you'll make it today. Uh, if you haven't signed up, we'll have some extra food, and we'd love for you to, to check that out this morning. Also, Easter is just around the corner, and we are looking for some folks to help us out with the Easter egg hunt. Uh, we need some serious egg hiders and uh, other, other roles with that. We're also inviting you to bring candy, uh, non-chocolate, individually wrapped candy uh, leading up to that. And uh, so we've got a lot of fun things planned for Easter and we'd love for you to, to be a part of that. If you can help out with that, just bring your candle. You can put it near the uh, temperature check station, and uh, that would be a big help. Uh, we have a couple of breakfasts coming up. One is the 55 Club Breakfast. Our ministry to older adult, uh, adults is the 55 Club. is coming up on Saturday, March 27th at 8.30 here at the church. If you're able to come, please let us know. Also, uh, the Gap Group is uh, going to be starting up real soon that is our ministry to graduates and professionals uh, March 21st at 6 p.m. in the student center they'll have their their uh, time of worship they'll doing a study of Joshua and have dessert they're also inviting folks to bring games uh, to board games to, to play as well and uh, so if you'd like to be a part of that you can sign up on the connect card this Wednesday morning at, at uh, March 17th at 6 45 a.m. We'll have our men's breakfast here, men's breakfast and Bible study here at the church, and we hope you could join us for that. Uh, we'll be doing a, a brief uh, Bible study in Peter, and uh, we'd love for you to be, and have a full breakfast as well. And if you just sign up to let us know how much food to get, that would be helpful. There is a kids' ministry reset meeting that is coming up uh, on uh Monday, April 5th at 6.30 p.m. For those who are interested in knowing more about our Awana plan and our VBS plan, if you have a heart for those things, please plan on attending. Also, uh, the Northwoods Family Experiment is an opportunity for families to uh, teach biblical lessons in their homes. We give you a kit of things to work on. There's a Bible lesson and a video to watch as well. And uh, if you haven't picked yours up already, I think there are a couple still out there near the temperature check station on the way in. And uh, you can pick those up. And if you're interested in being a part of those in the future, just sign up on your Connect card, and we'll make sure you get the information. We also are encouraging folks to have uh, to talk to people about the gospel. We call those gospel conversations. We're hoping to celebrate a thousand gospel conversations this year. If you've had gospel conversations, uh, we encourage you to write someone's name on a ball and drop it in to the display there, and uh, that will be an encouragement and remind us to pray. 
think of those are the announcements. We are going to be receiving a, a, an offering this morning. We're doing it at the boxes near the door on the way out, if you'll drop it in there. Also, uh, you can uh, give online through our website at northwoodschurch.org backslash giving or text to give by texting the word give to 812-214-1987. And, uh, and so those are our announcements this morning. We are encouraging folks to pray, uh, to grow in prayer throughout this year. And through the month of, month of March, we're encouraging folks to pray for somebody who needs to know Jesus. And so uh, we're going to close this morning by praying for those who need to know Christ. If you want a reminder of that, in the foyer, the, are, there are these little Who's Your One cards, a place for you to write the name of somebody that you know that you'd like to see come to know Christ. And we encourage you to pray and, and ask God to work in their lives. And then as God gives you opportunity to share the gospel with them, feel free to pick those up in the foyer. Let's stand together, and we'll, I'll dismiss you. I hope that the rest of your day is, uh, is a great one. So pray together. Lord, we are grateful for the fact that there is grace and mercy in you, and we're grateful that you offer it to us freely in Christ. And I pray that in these, uh, these days ahead, Lord, that we would just recognize afresh your grace, your mercy that's shown to us. And Lord, I pray that we would be those who extend grace to others, those who need uh, to know you as Savior, Lord, I pray that you would give us eyes to see the fields that are ripe unto harvest around us and help us to be faithful to share the gospel. And uh, Lord, we just pray for friends, for loved ones, for co-workers who need to know you. And Lord, help us to live the gospel and share the gospel this week. Lord, we pray that you would bless this day. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. You're dismissed. Surrounding me, let it